Good evening and welcome everyone to the last virtually speaking talk of this academic year. We're going out in style with a very special evening of poetry with Peter Pegnell. Peter is a Latimerian who was at the school during the swinging 60s, which is perhaps when his love of literature took root and flourished. His passion for the written word, no doubt enhanced whilst being taught at university by the likes of Seamus Heaney. One look at Peter's career and you're left in no doubt as to where his heart lies. A published poet of seven collections, Peter also writes theatre and poetry reviews, gives lectures on poetry and was head of English at two secondary schools. He has held the title of poet in residence at various universities, schools and, no connection, prisons and has won awards for his work. Last year, Peter edited a wonderful anthology entitled Pestilence. This collection of poems focuses on the shared experience of the COVID pandemic. The brief he gave to the 15 contributing artists was to write or draw an honest account of what they felt rather than what they felt they ought to say or represent. The anthology, the anthology published last December includes four of Peter's poems as well as works by respected poets around the globe. In the first segment of tonight's talk, we're going to enjoy readings and discussions around six of the poems from this anthology. I'm sure, like me, you'll find the experience incredibly cathartic. Assisting Peter will be uh, with the readings will be our very own Sally Markovska, former teacher of English and head of, of year at Latimer, along with Gerard Noyo, who will be reading Baudelaire both in the original French and the English translation. We, we ask you to keep your microphones off until we start the discussion so that we can all hear the readings clearly, but please do use the chat facility to post questions you might have on any aspects of the poems. After the readings, we'll play Towards the Light, which is a really moving film featuring four of Peter's poems set alongside a powerful arrangement composed by trumpeter Chris Dowding. Kate Monroe on clarinet completes the trio, and I'll introduce the film in a little more detail later. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Peter now. Peter, welcome. Um, I wonder if perhaps before we start the readings, you might give us a very brief insight into the creation of, of this anthology, Pestilence. So when, when did you decide to put together this collection? It was, um, it was March the 17th, St. Patrick's Day. And uh, I don't say that because of my Irish connection, it's just something I clearly remember. Um, poets do speak to each other, they edit each other's work um, and communicate very much like that. So it's, 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 it's sort of using the Facebook type facility quite effectively, I think, which may not always be the case. Anyway, I'd been uh, corresponding with Leslie Saunders, who's both a poet, a dramatist, and a translator. And like, well, we were all plunged into a situation that we couldn't comprehend, that we felt that history was happening here and now, that it was something that, and it felt fairly close to a duty, not a wider social duty, but kind of a duty, an individual duty, which then might become a corporate one. Um, anyway, I sent her a poem, which was essentially very light, um, and largely self-mocking, and it was based on um, the, the panic buying um, syndrome, the, the sudden, you know how in, in England, when there's a bank holiday, people, people buy as if, you know, it's for the millennium, don't they? The, supermarket drawers bash into you. And I just came up with this concept of me panic buying editions of my own poetry. <laughs> um, and th that sort of took me where it took it. And it's a very clear reflection of me. I was a frightened man. So in, in frightened circumstances, I, I, t I tend to make sometimes, you know, quite foolish jokes really. The poem's not bad though, in its own way. And Leslie responded with a poem which was more than not bad as far as I'm concerned. Poetry can do so many different things. I think, you know, if it'll do anything tonight, I hope we can get rid of some perhaps rather fusty preconceptions about it. Anyway, she said more or less likely to me, perhaps we should have an anthology. And I probably slightly nervously giggled. The next morning I, I actually phoned her and I said, yeah, we are, aren't we? <laughs> so, <laughs> but basically, and it was a very simple formula. I invited people poets I knew from across the world, uh, mostly Europe, but we, we've got a couple from one from Canada, one from the States, um, whose work I admired, whose work was often very different from my own. Um, and 
the only brief, and, and, and I knew they would say something interesting, not a definitive statement, not a, not a political position, although that might enter into it, but something which said at this time, this was how my reaction was. And if there's one thing that I knew about all of them is that they would be prepared to take risks, even if at the risk of sounding wrong, I had several poets who turned me down because they thought, oh, it's far too early. Well, right. you know, it's not far too early because we're in it. We yeah. might write very differently in a year, a year or so's time. So that's that's really the provenance of it. It was, um, <laughs> if you want to be nasty about it, say Peter and his friends, but they're, they're jolly convincing friends. I'm very proud of them and I'm proud of what they submitted. Oh, oh the other thing was they had a maximum of four poems. I'm also pleased to say we had, uh, we had people who'd, who'd heard about this who were kind of edging their way towards me at the party, but no go. <laughs> right, I see. So you, <laughs> quote, you, you, you had, you had the, the poets that you wanted involved That's and right. you worked together as a, as a group. That, probably not worked together. No, actually, probably not. I do have to say not that. I think very much right. by themselves. Then they submitted them. And then uh, Gerard and I did quite a lot of work grouping the poems because we were aware that it wasn't just a stodge. They were uh, very much individual voices, but those individual voices reflected and sometimes contradicted each other. And it was quite easy in a way to produce an anthology which had, which, which was thematic. Right. I could go on forever, I'm talking right. too much. No, 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 That's, we, want to, we want to hear about it, but let's hear the first poem. Sally, would you, are you ready to read? Yeah. Okay, the first poem, which will come up on the screen now, I believe. This is this is the cover, isn't it, of the of the anthology? The illustrations are marvelous. Yeah, the illustrations Lynn, are beautiful. Lynn, could you put the first poem up, please? Thank you. So, what if we break them by Moira Don Donaldson? We are using the good glasses, cut crystal, delicate flutes, the ones with the snake on the stem bought in our early heady days. Glasses that don't usually get brought out, except for special occasions. Peter, can I ask you about this? Because when I read this, in, it is the first poem in the anthology, I thought, well, it's seemingly not about the pandemic at all um, until that ironic last line of special occasions in opposition to our early heady days. Um, can, you, can you say something about this poem, how, why you chose it? Maybe something about Moira? It was specifically because it doesn't, <clears throat> it doesn't appear to be about anything, well, about anything as public or, or momentous for that matter, um, as a poem to do with COVID-19. That was, so it's like an images poem with a certain amount of melancholy, a memory of the past. I mean, it would stand by itself in, an, in a book which didn't purport to be that kind of anthology. So yeah. I thought, quite apart from the fact that I thought it was, it was in its own fragile way, very beautiful, um, yeah. I, I caught in. It took a, it took some work from the reader. So on the one hand, being a very simple poem, apparently simple poem, you need to know that these people are under threat. I mean, even the ambiguity of the first line. How do you say it? So, so what if we break them? Or so what if we break them? There's a, a challenge. There's a yeah, challenge as a, as, a, as a challenge. Yeah. And it's more as um, a, a family person, a person with with um, the same sort of responsibilities that most of us have. And what struck me and really moved me about this was the idea that she's cherishing those glasses in exactly the same way that she cherishes her, cherishes her ma marriage and her family, and the 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 bringing the glasses out could either be um, a celebration of what's important or it could be a kind of premonition of how that could all be shattered to pieces so that it's both yeah. the microcosm and the macrocosm to, together. At the same time as saying yeah. that, it seems to me I'm being very much too um, 
I'm killing the beauty of it, really, by speaking. Yes, of it. it is a very delicate poem, like the delicate flutes. But what I also noticed, and the more you read it, the more you see in it, that the snake on the stem is yeah. a threat, isn't it? There's a yes. threat yeah. in the snake, which I thought was, was it hints at sin and suffering and, and the pestilence, perhaps. Behind no, absolutely. Absolutely. And the special yeah. occasions, I mean, the special occasions can be an expression of love or something a good deal more sinister. Okay. So I think she holds the balance perfectly. Yes, it's beautiful. OK, something very different now. Um, we're going to the Baudelaire and Gerard is going to read. Oh, no, we're not. We're doing stay at home. Stay at home, oh, yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I missed. I've, I've jumped the gun. So the next one, stay at home. Uh, the famous Boris lines, um, <laughs> our, our message that we heard in March 2020. Um, this one is by Leslie Saunders, who um, Peter mentioned in his introduction. Um, in, the, in the actual anthology, actually, it's dated the 1st of April 2020, and I thought that date was perhaps significant. Peter might tell us um, about that afterwards. Stay at Home by Leslie Saunders house arrest and the days are getting longer the living room's a wilderness of dust and shadows since she stopped answering the front door though it's becoming harder to say when anyone last came by she has ghosts for company now she can hear the flutter of their breathing like a host of moths caught in the web of her neck Beyond the pane, she can see where the great street is lying at full length in both endless directions, how a faint road marking of moss is beginning to creep its way down the middle, turning aside from the sight of nothing and no one. She's suddenly hungry, brushing the crumbs off the table into the cup of her hand. She gives thanks and swallows pecks water with her fingers from the dripping tap. Soon her toes will curl into wires, her voice dry to a husk. I love the imagery, imagery in, this, in this poem. It's very disturbing. Um, even the great street is lying at full length in both directions like a corpse in front of her um, as her life drains away from her. Anyway, tell us about this poem, Peter, um, and why it's dated the 1st of April. Um, <clears throat> I can't tell you about the precise date, except that it's a month in. I'm sorry, I, I, I really okay, can't fine. do that. Yeah. Um, uh, as you were saying, I'm sure Peter will tell us. I was thinking of some, you know, wizard explanation, but I may as well <laughs> be honest. I, have, I really have no idea, except as I say, it's that time that, that, that's passed. I, I mean, I think the one of the strengths of this poem is that as it begins, a nightmare situation is very carefully unfolded. And you're quite right, the road, where does it go in either direction and the moss growing on it? But the solitude at first seems to me to be, well, incredibly relevant to, you know, to many people's lives, especially of course, people of, of advanced years. Um, and that's, clear and it's without any clear there's no sort of voice of of pity or no voice actually describing the circumstances it's almost like the person is turned into a kind of object which is enumerated in the poem but then at the very end it, it becomes like a, a metamorphosis doesn't it from from mm. from Ovid she's transformed and there's a sense almost that the spirit when you're isolated so much, almost like a post-nuclear situation, if you look outside the window, that the spirit almost willfully dies. If you're not in human contact, then however idiosyncratic you may be, Miss Havisham has always got a broken heart. This mm. character here in the story um, mm. is, is ossified by the end, and those images of the wire and the, and the voice drying to a husk, I mean, they bring a about a sense of mortality, which is even larger than the idea of extreme loneliness, extreme solitude, giving, giving you, you know, anguish. It's more than anguish. It's like a transformation, which may be visited on any of us. It's dark stuff. It's right very up. dark. Um, there's that sort of communion image of giving thanks. 
Yes. But instead of giving life, it sort of takes away. So away from civilization and life, we all become the ghosts that she has for company. That, you really get that atmosphere, don't yeah. you, I think? And it's yeah. it's so meticulously done. And she's chosen, well, they're far longer than pentameters, the lines, but they, they move up even beyond, you know, even beyond uh, 14 syllables. But somehow that works effortlessly in the narrative and it slows you right down to until you get the, yeah. until you get the kick at the end. I found it quite difficult to read because of the enjambement between yes. verses. It's, you yes. Just, yeah. She's, anyway, she, she's also we, she's sorry. also an actress. Um, oh. It would be very nice for you to be able to hear her, wouldn't it? I I'd love her to. I think you did beautiful. I think you did beautifully, incidentally. Oh, thank you, thank you. Right, moving on to the Baudelaire, which I talked about before. Um, we're very lucky to have um, an, um, a, a French speaker, Gerard, who's going to read first of all uh, the poem in in English. For those, for all of us whose French isn't uh, fluent, and then um, Gerard's going to read it in uh, the French, which I think is beautiful. Um, just hearing it will be beautiful, even if we don't understand all of it. So first of all, we're going to hear "Meditation" by Charles Baudelaire in English. Gerard. Meditation. Calm down my grief, be stiller still. You called out for the night, it falls, it's here. A dark mist wraps around the town to some bringing peace, to others anxiety. As the vile mass of mortals and the cush of pleasure, this pitiless executioner Go gather remorse in the raves to slavery. My grief, give me your hand. Come this way, far from them. See the lost years bent forward in antique gowns on heaven's balconies. See rise from the depths of the waters smiling regret. See the dying sun fall asleep under an arch, and like a long shroud fanning out in the east. Listen, my dear one, listen to the sweet night on the march. Uh, may I have the French text, please? Recueillement. Sois sage, oh ma douleur, et tiens-toi plus tranquille. Tu réclamais le soir, il descend, le voici. Une atmosphère obscure enveloppe la ville, aux uns portant la paix, aux autres le souci. Pendant que des mortels, la multitude de villes, la multitude de villes, sous le fouet du plaisir, ce bourreau sans merci, va cueillir des remords dans la fête servile. Ma douleur, donne-moi la main. Viens par ici, loin d'eux. Vois se pencher les défuntes années sur les balcons du ciel en robe surannée, surgir du fond des eaux le regret souriant, le soleil moribond s'endormir sous une arche et comme un long linceul traînant à l'Orient, entends ma chère, entends la douce nuit qui marche. Thank you, Gerard. That was utterly beautiful. Um, I was very struck earlier reading this that the well, it, it's it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful poem. What is it about? Can I ask you, Gerard, because you you know this poem very well? Can you? Uh, it's about grief. Yeah. He's addressing his grief actually he owns the grief and he is the grief and the two merge together and possibly to me uh, this question of ownership is so important and it is was I suppose relevant in it in any times of difficulty that 
however much you want to think that the grief is being imposed on you, no, it is you, it is part of you. Yeah, yeah. He does, he, he does almost take himself into his confidence. He speaks to himself in the, in the sonnet, doesn't he? So these, his memories of, well, living it up, you know, the, the, the beginning of the fleur de mal and his whole, if you like, a nearly satanic quest for pleasure. He's saying goodbye to that. And it's, it's an effort to come to terms with death but it, it seems to me there's, you're absolutely right, Gerard, that the, the, the ownership requires him to somehow settle himself. And so it's a statement. It's written very near the end of his life, I believe, isn't it? And, and Published uh, after his death. Okay, <laughs> well, there we go. So, so that sort of, but I think, I think there's a strange sort of tenderness in it, in those impossible circumstances. And, and that, uh, okay, it's always a risk to put a, a truly great poem into an anthology mm. but it it did it does do the job that people were very much not allowed well we're not out of it are we how do we deal with the dying how do we deal ourselves with the possibility of ours or our, our or our loved ones well Baudelaire has a tough enough mind to face the reality of that and some to, and somehow somehow to float to stay afloat you know the the it's that soft, isn't it? That march, the death, the last line, is mm. almost consolatory. Mm. I think. I think that's certainly why I cherish it. It's lovely. It is. It is lovely. Isn't it lovely to have just about enough French to really appreciate it? Yes. yes. <laughs> what, what I think is important to remember with Baudelaire, he did lead a a life of pleasure, drugs, women, and what have you. But with drugs, he gave them up because what, it, what the drugs did was to uh, uh, leave him without his duality, good and evil, yeah. could not, and that got messed up. And he could, not, he could not live with that. And in the end, the humanity, the suffering, uh, and what have you, is something that one has to accept and live with, because that's our humanity. Well Thank said. You. Thank you both for that. It's a beautiful poem. Um, and I almost feel that, you know, in the second verse, the, the vile mass of mortals the, with the cosh of pleasure, it's almost the, the idea that we now, if we think about it in contemporary world, that we're being punished for our hedonism. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I think we need to move on um, to curve flattening. Um, next slide, please, Lynn. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, this poem is called Curve Flattening by Damien Smith. Um, he wrote it on Easter Sunday, um, which I think is important to note because it is about not being able to get to see the people or, or the place you want to be uh, in Easter 2020. It's not even possible to get home now for a fact and even the thought of it has come out as remote, in sympathy with the time. How change works. It hurts now to think of the graves among disease lying shut in perfectly, behind a curfew other than death. We would have looked to Easter for visiting them, to sit by the side of the ruins, six feet distant, by those cellars as though underwater, the loved so close as though just an arm's length off, which in fact they are, leeching through the soil, the already buried populations everywhere who know everything and have known it for all the time we have been tracking its progress, airway by airway through checkpoints, until it has arrived, finally, in our own mouths, like new words, like civilization. I find that last line very interesting, Peter. <laughs> it sort of jars for me after this. Um, could you say something about the poem and what you understand by, by it? The two um, <clears throat> by the dead relative. I, I'll do my, I, I will do my best. I think it's, um... 
I think the tone of the poem is, is, is a very stately, almost gracious tone, um, which focused on, you know, figures of no great grandeur, so that I think that it, it leads you through its own sort of, there's a kind of a pilgrimage in the poem, um, in which the frustration and the difficulty and the, and the if you like, in a sense, the outrage to intimacy um, is, is not overstated, but occasionally the, the, the nearness of the relatives leeching the, that, that, mm. that figure there, um, the idea that um, there's a run on where it says, yes, in fact, they are. Um, it, it's, it's um, I think it's intention is, is very spiritual really, as, long as, as well as domestic. But, but I think that the title, the, the, uh, the curve flattening, it seems to me there's something even more sinister in choosing that because it, I mean, I could be wrong, but isn't one way of achieving a curve flattening, curve flattening is that enough people die so the hospital services can deal with that situation. Yeah. Um, and yeah. the and the very last line, the idea of mouthing—that's how we give voice to the situation that we're in, that we're responding to. And I think it's just a question: Do we, you know, <laughs> you know that when um, Gandhi was asked what did he think about the idea of um, of a Western civilization, he said it would, that would be a good idea. Um, <laughs> I, I think that Damien, who is very much an Ulster man and Ulster, Ulster Catholic, it's horrible to have to say that, but that, that's uh, actually true, has lived through publicly very difficult times, and I think is bringing that same kind of knowledge and understanding to bear on, you know, do we deserve peace? Do we deserve, for our, even for our civilization, if it is that, to continue? Mm. Is that is does that make any sense? Yes, um, it does. It does. I, I I was looking for constant references that brought the current situation to mind as well. You know, curve flattening. Yes, yes. Um, yes. Six feet distant. That idea of social distances and checkpoints and yes. tracking its progress. Um, but now you tell me he's a, a Catholic Ulsterman. I wonder if there's a, you know, the the whole of Easter. Um, also has a relevance to, very, to yeah very much so very much so I think and I think that you know hearing you say those words that you picked out very wisely this idea of, of somehow human humanity in that context being being reduced mm. from what it might be able to be you know actually it's Easter Saturday we don't quite get to to the rising on Sunday I don't no. think in the poem I, don't, I I think I think it's very challenging. One thing which I think might be of interest to people is that Damien is, he's the literature and drama officer for the Arts Council in Northern Ireland. He is phenomenally busy. And in fact, at the moment, his health is poor as a result of, you know, what he, he's, he's got far too big a brief, but he does it with tremendous passion. <clears throat> and it really struck me that when his work pattern changed and things died down, he, he he produced something like 10 poems within about four or five weeks. It was just that energy and, mm -hmm. and a kind of inner rage maybe as well as moving, yeah. coming out of him. It's, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of thinking of the anthology almost like one does of a child. You know, you can see that side of Damien there in a very much earlier poem. You can see a side of Damien which is softer and a man who loves the small village that he lives in. And I think that's one of the strengths of the whole book. You get yeah. contrasts. Well, that's why, right. let's, let's now, get to you, Peter, because the last poem in the anthology is, is by you, um, yeah. uh, On the Road, um, and uh, here it is, last, yes, last slide. Um, and I think Peter's going to read this himself, which is only right, and then um, we can talk briefly about it. I'm very conscious we've got to show uh, your lovely film as well, so let's um, have a brief discussion about your lovely, your great poem, Peter. Uh, <clears throat> um, this poem is, is, well, hopefully a kind of, it's a premature cry of triumph, actually. Um, don't think that I spend all my time writing um, poems with sardonic humour, only about 98% of it. Um, on the road. 
Shops shuttered, playhouses dark. Suspicion stalks the streets, quicksilver as any virus, ubiquitous. Make no mistake, someone somewhere is making a mint, stashing away the gains in the Caymans, stockpiling oil, forging wills, spreading opinion like Marmite. When the plague hit London, Shakespeare and the boys hit the road. Nowhere towns burgeoned with life, opened wide houses and wives. Rugely, Swatham, Reading, scared the gentry witless. Riots for real were just around the corner. No such breakaways for us. We poetasters meet on WhatsApp. Starved of random love and contact, shell-offs with nothing to show, empty spaces sown with sterility. Like a damned stream, we'll burst forth. It'll be Mardi Gras, the Day of the Dead, the French house on VE Day. Mm -hmm. Believe me, we'll drown the chimes at midnight. Sorry, deafen. Deafen, but actually both work. Yeah, I like drown, that's good. Yeah, I do too. And I like the fact that we poetasted the meeting on WhatsApp and now, yeah. we're, and now we're meeting on Zoom. That was all intended, of course. I, was, I had a presence, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I also like the idea of deafening or drowning is still a threat. There's that joyous optimism in that last stanza but at the same time there's a threat the deafening and the drowning yes there is i mean i did i did the names of the towns to which the shakespeare company went that, that they're real that's yes, and, 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 and 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 i'm quite sure a lot of shenanigans took place <laughs> my, old, my, my older brother being of a, 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 a far more formal friend of mine said uh, well it wasn't very good for them to take the plague with them was it there's no parallel there at all <laughs> so, <laughs> we've got to have some fun haven't we? <laughs> yeah okay well um i don't know whether any sean can i pass over to you now yeah of course yeah easy. thank you thank you both they, that was fantastic to hear these poems kind of brought to life i love the um the line on in yours, Peter, that talks about show-offs with nothing to show. And I wondered about, you know, po do, do poets, do you feel that need to perform work? I mean, is, is it not enough to write? Do you really need to be performing too? It's a very good question. I mean, I'll hide behind to a certain extent because it's true that the, 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 the past of, poetry the center of poetry really is oral poetry that yeah. tradition so that and but it doesn't make the the it doesn't make the poet any less significant in some in some ways very much more so so the the storytelling aspect of poetry does mean a great deal to me another more sort of it may be sort of selfish thing is that reading aloud a poem to an audience is is a very good way of understanding it more yourself because mm. Look, I don't believe, I mean, I, you know, the great marvellous T.S. Eliot very often writes things about his work that I find myself not, not according with. It isn't, and his reading of The Wasteland is, is, is well, it's as dry as dust as he really wasn't. So I, 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 I think yeah. I th it's absolutely fascinating. And the, the Heaney thing, I, every time I read, I mean, he has the most marvellous, warm, embracing yeah. voice. And that tremendous personality, but at the same time, slightly withdrawn, his eyes narrowing and a smile in them, that experience is inimitable, you know? So I think yeah. from many different angles, I do think it's an extremely good thing. And I think it's a real mistake when poetry loses its connection with music and with rhythm and with the, mm -hmm. the that whole business, because your heart and your breathing is engaged. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, I said, I mean, certainly as, as an audience, you know, as, as a, lover of literature um i'm slightly nervous of poetry actually yeah. um and only when it's spoken do i feel like i have a i have a handle on it and i mean i wondered i'd be interested <laughs> in both you and sally as teachers as well i mean how you know how do you get students interested i mean are they as nervous as maybe they're not so nervous if you start early I think children learn poetry very early through nursery rhymes. Yeah. Love the sound and the repetition. Yes. But and I think it's it's 
you know, poetry can be very exciting. I think lots of young people, especially teenagers, are very nervous of it. I like yeah. reading, but I don't like poetry because it's elitist and it's difficult and it's challenging. But taught the right way, you can have such fun with it. And I think they that, you know, I, I, I'd like to think that um, good English teachers do bring it to life. And, may, and maybe that's the only time you read poetry is in school. Uh. You know, and, and that's, that's a shame. And I think that's why I guess, you know, but then pe teenagers say, but what's the difference between poetry and, and song lyrics? Well, nothing. Oh, really. yeah. Yes. And so they all love those, don't they? And, and yeah. repeating those and hearing those and, and, and writing them. Um, so, you know, it's about bringing it to life and, and enjoying the, the sound of the words. Can I, can I just I absolutely, I mean, I'm convinced it wouldn't, it wouldn't trouble me at all to either send myself as a young man or my granddaughter to just be taught by you. That's, you know, I'm, <laughs> but, but I think very often English teachers themselves are nervous, very nervous. I mean, if I give you for ex an example, I was, um, I was employed to actually teach a, teach a writing workshop to 42, more, most of them are heads of English in Berkshire. It was a whole of Berkshire. And I think it's the most, well, apart from the fact there are far too many people there, but they simply would not risk writing. They needed to know, they wanted to bring a theoretical term in straight away. And I actually had to treat, I say, I don't want to hear anymore. It's terrifying that blank page, but you haven't now got in front of you any notes. And the, the worst mistake is to treat a poem as if, as if it's something that has to be translated. So you have the poem on the left-hand side of the page and all the annotations on the other side yeah. of the page. And by the time yeah. you're facing those, the poem's dissolved. In fact, yeah. the poem does dissolve. It escapes out of the window and it's gone down the road. I think that's, that's, that's absolutely right. Um... And that's actually when you're studying at a university or it, you can end up being more terrified at the end than you were at the beginning. So I think, I think that's absolutely right. But shall we, and thank you um, both for, for your brilliant reading. Shall we have a look at this film now? I'm just going to say a few words, Peter, please do, you know, um, uh, correct me if, if I've got anything wrong, but the film is called Towards the Light and it features four of your poems, Peter, and it's set alongside music composed by um, trumpeter Chris Dowding, that, that's mm, right, yes. isn't it, with Kate Munro on clarinet, so that's the trio. And the first poem uh, is, is, is called Peter's, uh, called Pegnall's Inferno. And Peter, this is, this is about a journey from the, the, the kind of fear and darkness of clinical depression towards you know, edging towards recovery is it, that's right, isn't it? Yes. And uh, and and uh, I, I mean, think, think... Sean, sure, that's precisely right. It's, it's it, in a sense, it's as simple as that. But that describes how bloody difficult it is, doesn't yeah. it? So it? It's and and it seemed to me because it's a condition I have I'm familiar with it that yeah. if I could somehow capture both how threatening it is, but that there are you know possibilities, then I thought that. Um, it might help others. That sounds a bit sanctimonious, but no, I really no, no, think, yeah. That, you know that, that you know, you, yeah. Because you're surrounded by platitudes, <laughs> and you're yeah. for, you're fearful of those. You know, when when will it be? When will it end? And I think that that somehow or other, and I was well. I mean, the whole thing is a kind of a twenty minute show, twenty five minute show. That there's a, there's the movement towards the light is no by no means a simple thing but there are poems that I put there specifically to say this is what it is to be human and and basically it's it's uh, the sounds and the existence of nature and it's the voices of children yeah that's and, a, the, mu and the music <laughs> and Peter the music is 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 the music a, a sort of a musical soundscape of of, of how you're feeling that was the in a way that was the idea you see chris chris i believe we all have forms of expression which are which are given to us and that we and 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 in a way you can't explain it so for chris the, composing that music is the only way he feels comfortable with respond, responding to my words and right. to me that's an alchemy to me i mean it's such a privilege yeah <laughs> have yeah. that sort of response which is which isn't in words and then Kate 
her instrument is 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 much less terrifying than his in a way. You know, yeah. we use the trumpet. It's it's a military instrument, and so you know, and the, and the great rage of jazz and so on. The clarinet is a much more, and and you'll see that she's much more evident in the in the final poems. But there is a little life in that woman, and I love that. And it's the, I mean, if I also tell you that it was the film was made in a proper recording studios on the edge of a damp, sodden Norfolk turnip patch. It was so it was weird and lovely to get in there that you were in a kind of spaceship which just consisted of the of the art. And, and it made me impressed by the technicians. The guy who made the film, about a third of the way through, he said, I get it. And then he oh, was in That's great. That's great. Well, let's yeah. see it. Let's see it. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. This piece we're going to present to you um, is called Towards the Light, and it's an effort to communicate the incommunicable condition of, of severe depression. Um, and the music and the, and the language, if they can be said to be inarticulate, then th this, this oddly is what we're trying to create. But I think you'll find there are moments of humor, very often directed at the, um, at the writer, himself um and we'll we'll give it a go in any case and hope that nobody leaves before the end um the epigraph to the piece is from plato always a wise man to turn to we can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark the real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light pagnol's inferno Locked inside a car, faces looming through the windows, familiar faces reflected on the back of a spoon. A leaden casket, without and within, darkness visible, no golden promise. For Christ's sake, let it not. It did. A trap door to the underworld, only the one shade. Only the one anti-self, the others have all fled. Handbooks of helpful strategies, toiling the hills on his bike, swimming the endless sermon of the lost. Terror in the night, circular walks, counting the steps, avoiding street lights, unfollowed fugitive outside it all. Measures taken fall away. Leaves torn from rotting branches, unspectacular. His cage is made of glass, filled with fog. It's not smooth like that. It's flattened, but craggy. Mess and morass. A silent scream. Who is that man in the mirror? Angular, flabby, a cubist construct jumbled together by a piss artist. A soundtrack by Captain Beefheart, his father's son in need of a shade. He has been in better shape. He has been in better shape. If only we reduce the dose, 
he might manage. Manage? Increase the dose. Put him out. And when he wakes, if he wakes, his legs obey, his mouth obeys, his eyes behind a visor obey, betray him. He is not worth this misery. Save it for someone who will learn from it, bear witness, transcend self-pity. Transcend? Entrench is all he has. Books no more, they stare from the shelves. Music accuses, feeding time a riot of pills, a cue of one, a blue star every time. Sleep, thank Morpheus, sleep and sleep. The view from the black blind, all he requires. Sex, what? The depressed patient must not isolate. As if it were a choice. As if the fishmonger, the butcher and the baker, the checkout person conspire to despise him. Get a right old laugh to scan his wartime rations. He confirms their dignity, the fruits of their labour, is reliably the man, the worthless loafer they would not wish to be as if he were the centre of their universe, as he is the entire void of his own. Loved ones, friends, they wait, are there, whilst he is not. They wait as he cannot wait, sees no end. He retains the grace to credit their fidelity. Quite simply, they keep him here. A robin on the crazy paving, undeterred by the monster in the deck chair, poses for a Christmas card in October. Having no concept of beauty, it has no fear of ugliness, though never so frightful. For once, the patient is unashamed, holds the moment like a cup full of water in his suppliant palms, does not question does not even crave to believe this could be the beginning of the end, a crack in the cylinder, sits still. He charged £400, the psychiatrist, wore a hideous tie, not unnoticed, concocted a cocktail of drugs, street value at least a grand and counting. He's the candy man, the electric shock, the witch doctor, the scalpel his pen in his left hand, the ultimate court of appeal. The verdict leaked out in scraps, an easier breath here, almost a smile there, the telephone lost its teeth. A string quartet turned up in his bedroom and he did not muffle them out. Then, by the sea, with his daughter on the same walk that had been prison exercise, follow the arrows, he leant on the railing, gazed ahead towards the wind farm and the Arctic. I like that. No reply, no analysis. Hand in hand with wandering steps and slow, home to the hope of ordinary pain. The reason why, immersed in the as yet inarticulate cry that spelt gratitude, that spelt praise however ineffable and endless the sky.
of course, the current catastrophic social circumstances ma made it rather less strange to be strange. Um, so the mask was very helpful, you can imagine, and almost nobody talking. Well, if they, if they did talk, you couldn't hear. Um, so this is a poem which is was written re retrospectively, of course, and it is, I suppose, my frightened state of the nation poem, wondering what might happen next, if there is going to be a next. So post-war rhetoric. It's astonishing the constraint we've shown. Like ants, we climb and fall, shoulder each new avalanche, make our discreet ways past crushed companions, our rationed rituals of grief, the touch of love. We make song from a frayed fabric, wafer thin, stretched tight across the bone. Only the coffins dance. Few howl or rage. Our spirits seep away, mere leakage, numbers in a hat. Moments immortalise. Do you remember when, or that was the last time I... No wonder self-harm is almost a pastime. Inertia, the order of most days. Bravo, the unsung heroes. Bravo you, and bravo me, the roar of silence. That bright dawn, the convicts emerge, blink and pinch themselves, look around, slightly embarrassed to face the faces shrouded so long. What shall we do? Guzzle champagne, seals at feeding time, resume coitus interruptus, at a loss five flurried minutes later. Born again, bore ourselves to death, it may be like this, gratitude, then the happy cloak of habit, disbelief and easy acceptance. Worse than that, therapy nation, navel gazing like never before. Worse still, this passive demi-life channeled into conformity. There are reasons to be angry. High time for a welfare state? There is recovery, absolutely there is recovery, we do believe that. And I think the, the things to turn to, or the things which speak to us the most, are actually very traditional things, like the voice of nature, like the power and glory of children, like the possibility of love. You know, those small things that somehow transform us. So we said towards the light, well, Get your sunglasses out. High in the forest, bats sing through shimmering leaves. Their pitch closer to heaven than earth-born angels. They understand their place through sound, flit, and settle, swarm in a green canopy. Closer to the ground, music thuds against the great trunks, muffled in moss, ricochets from beech to oak to willow. Cautiously we enter. Sense an ancient orchestra, a play of wind and water. Intruders, it takes effort and nerve to learn the melody of being alive. Read love and hate, sometimes too late for comfort. Fine vibrations thread heart to heart, 
revive what we lost from the start. Of course, we're not compelled to make a choice between the, the beauty and the wonder of nature and the, and the beauty of human love and, and contact, um, nor, nor should we accept that. They do belong together. We, I firmly believe that Earth is the right place for love. Um, and our final work this evening is a triumphant fusion of, of nature and ourselves, I suppose, and you, and you as well. We're all in the same dance, and we can do it with tremendous elegance and style sometimes, I think. Picture two little faces at your gate or over the, leaning over the fence, gazing at you as you're concentrating on John Milton's Paradise Lost. Well, Jasmine and Daisy, my neighbours, absolutely not about to go away, so John Milton put away for the day and the poem will tell you the story. They, they left a note for me after this event, and I'll read you the, the note, because, of course, this note of theirs is in danger of being better than any line of poetry I could write. Thank you for the flowers you let us plant. Thank you for spending time with us. No, Jasmine and Daisy, it is I who must thank you. Delicate as willow patterns, your faces peeked over the gate. Watched me reading. Careful to leave the gate open, I closed the book, told them to wait. Bought a tray of pansies at the store, their faces peeking above the plastic. Smiles as gleeful as snowfall. One by one, they dipped caves in the soil, poured water, gently paced the flowers, firmed the earth with their tiny hands. Six pansies each, yellow, white, purple, dark eyes like ink stains. A flower show in my backyard. The girls left, knew it was time. Heartsease, that ancient name. Thank you, Peter. That was um, that was a really intimate and powerful film. And I, I wonder, from your from writing it, did, did, was it was it a kind of a healing process for you, or, or or not? I think if I go back to your your previous question about the compulsion or the uh, what what difference it makes to present something, I th I think yes, there is. Um, <laughs> the imagination is certainly working in my favour in a context like that. Oh. And Beckett has a, a name for a, actually one of his late unreadable books called Imagination Dead. Imagine. It's, he's so good at actually saying something, then being negative and then coming again. Oh. And, I and I think that, that that's maybe sort of the movements of the mind can be like that. So you, you, you well, you, you trust you've reached that, but it, it's, um, th this recognizing the agency that other people have in your life 
that's also a very very large part of that and so that's and it's you know so I feel it's a privilege that you've listened to it as well does that make yeah. sense you know I, I don't yeah. <clears throat> there is no vanity in the writing of it and actually it doesn't feel as if there's any vanity in the in the performing of it there may be vanity afterwards when people are nice to me. <laughs> but, but yeah, but, but the actual know act. You know what I mean, I think. Yeah, and, yeah, I, no. And I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a, I would be, have been an absolutely hopeless actor. I mean, I really don't know what to do with my body. If I just gesticulate it with my hand, I leave it in the air and wonder why it was up there in the first place. But <laughs> I think I think I can turn somersaults with words. And I think yeah. that's, yeah. I think I think that's a, a fantastic quote to end on somersets somersaults with 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 words. Um, I mean, I just want to say to our guests, if if they would like to buy a copy, I think that if they email us, that might be the best way to email the foundation office, and then we'll we'll take it from there with you, Peter. I think. Lovely. Yes. And uh, yeah, so if I can just say thank you to Peter for sharing this fantastic anthology and his own work. And Sally for being such a brilliant reader and yeah. um, interviewer as well. And Gerard, I mean, what a team. Um, and of course, the musicians. And thank you for, our, uh, for all our guests for sharing and for supporting the Virtually Speaking uh, series, which is uh, starting again in the autumn term, I think. Um, that we've got all the, all the talks and, and shows on, uh, online and um, we'll send out the link later uh, as a follow-up. So thank you everyone, thank you Peter, I hope you've enjoyed the experience. I, I loved it, thank you, yeah. Didn't enjoy the, the rest of the day up till now. <laughs> <Much>. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Good, well no, it's great. Um, so yeah, it just remains for me to say good night and we'll see you uh, in the autumn.